Around that topic, our next speaker is going to give you even more depth about how important it is, and most importantly, how customer data can help you create that customization for your e-commerce. So please, give a big round of applause to Vida from Lithuania. Welcome on stage. Thank you, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Zdravejte. Uh, I say I'm Vida, and that's all I know in Bulgarian for now. Uh, but I think that won't be a problem today. And first of all, thank you very much for everyone for coming, for staying. I hope more people are coming because we have prize coming up. And um, my topic today is also going to be very practical. I want to give you a lot of practical insights of how to do personalization on your e-commerce site. It's not going to be easy, so take notes, get ready to ask questions, and I'll try to cover it all for you in these 45 minutes. So before starting, I just wanted to ask a question. Um, how many of you know what is e-commerce personalization or how to personalize it? Okay, I see two hands, so my goal of today is that at the end you all know what is e-commerce personalization. Uh, so let's get going. And a little bit about myself. I'm, my name is Vaida, and I'm a marketing manager at Strands. I manage all the marketing efforts, optimization, and what makes me happy to go to work, to, to smile every day, is that I make retailers grow. I make them perform better every day. And this is really what I'm passionate about. I come from Barcelona, so I brought a little bit of sun to Sofia as well, uh, as you noticed. And I would love to hear your feedback after presentation. So get in touch with me on LinkedIn, Twitter, send me an email. I'm very reachable and a person that likes to communicate as well. And I do represent Strands, which is an e-commerce personalization suit. It's made for retailers who want to create one-to-one -one relationship with their customers. And we work with retailers all around the world, with companies like Disney, Panasonic, SkyMall, and hopefully some new Bulgarian ones as well. Um, I think it doesn't work. <laughs> Ooh, I like too many. Okay, the way I would like to approach today's topic is to firstly give you an overview of what is personalization, to give it an overview from marketer's perspective, not just a big thought leadership, big picture. Then I would like to tell you what consumers want and what they expect from online experience, to give you five or six examples of successful e-commerce personalization, and also a roadmap of how you should start personalizing today. So many times when I talk to retailers, they usually say, oh, I opened my website, I created an e-commerce store, but the sales don't come up. And I'm like, no, 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 Rome was not built in one day. So it's the same with uh, e-commerce. You cannot expect people to flood in if you don't do any more effort. An important thing to remember is to move away from misconceptions that are still in the retail space. For example, many people say, oh, Vida, it's too time consuming, I don't want to do it, it takes a lot of time. Yes, it does, if you want to build it all by yourself. But actually, it's very easy if you actually use tools like Strands or other personalization software. It's also not something that you have to create new content or create new material. All the information is at your fingertips. Everything is out there. You just have to maximize it and use it. In addition to that, personalization is not only for Emac, for Amazon, for Ozone. It's for everyone to use, and you should actually start implementing it today. And remember, everyone started somewhere. This is how Amazon looked in 1995. If you would have seen this image Yesterday, maybe just randomly, you wouldn't believe that this is Amazon, but yes, this is how they started. And if you can see, they say if you explore just one thing, make it our personal notification service. So they wanted to personalize since 1995. And we look at a huge transformation today. Today, they are the giants. Today, they are the leaders. So how did they approach personalization? What did they do? and how can you learn from that? 
The way I like to look at it is to compare it to the village type of experience. If you go to a local store in Bulgaria, in Sofia, and you want to buy this kashkaval that you'll just love, uh, the shopper might remember, oh, Nadia, you like this cheese, you like this kashkaval, would you like to buy it again? Or maybe you would like the one that your uncle liked or your brother bought yesterday. So personalization is actually bringing the village type experience using the machine learning and recreating it online. Or, <laughs> or in other terms, it's um, using data and technology to tailor all the information that you have and acknowledge who is the user on your site. So what kind of data is needed to personalize? I usually like to start with these five types of data. Firstly, by the personal data from the user, so his gender, maybe demographic information. Then I combine the browser and purchase history. What are they browsing on your site? What are they buying? What are they not buying? Um, and then, last but not least, we have to analyze their on-site behavior and their preferences. You might think, I know what they like. I know what my users buy, but you also have to keep in mind what they want to hear from you and what kind of information is important for them. So if 48% of shoppers actually spend more on a personalized, personalized site, do you believe that it's your next investment? I do. And if I'll have to give you one reason why personalization matters, it's because it helps you to fill out all the purchase, purchase funnel. It helps you to acquire the customers, it helps you to activate them, it helps you to retain them and win them back to your site. So what do they expect? What do consumers want nowadays? Let's look a little bit closer. Consumers want data. They want convenience and they want it very fast. Um, every time I'm shopping or I'm using a tablet, mobile, desktop, I want personalized experience, one-to-one -one relation to, to the store. And we as technology providers, we are constantly training uh, shoppers to want it more faster every day. It's not going to change. It's a trend that is going to last, and it's only up to you to catch. And just a few examples of what kind of personalization people prefer. And just to show you that there are a variety of ways to approach it, people usually like when the retailers adapt it to their own preferences. So alerts for the products they like, information about the sales on, or discounts of the products they viewed, many different ways. But we'll get a little bit more in depth about that later. Let's look at different examples of how big retailers, successful retailers, personalize their site. And I would like to start with Fashion Watches. It's a retailer that sells watches. And if you can see, the first visitor is a woman. How you can see that? Uh, well, first of all, the watches promoted are for female. Um, the female, let's say, my favorite name, Nadia, is uh, is buying things in summer, so she gets the seasonal offers, and she's buying it from USA, so she gets information um, about the shipping in USA. She doesn't get any surprises, because usually when shoppers buy, and then they reach the checkout page, and then, oh, these are the shipping costs, this is how much you have to pay extra. Now, you have to be very transparent about it. And for example, if my uncle visits a site, and he, of course, he doesn't want to buy a female match. Uh, he wants to buy a watch for himself. He gets a totally different experience. You can see the promotion are for male watches. He never bought a watch before. Maybe he browsed through some pages, reviewed some uh, products. So what retailer is doing, he is trying to incentivize the first purchase. So giving a 10% discount for the first purchase is a very common tactic. And he's buying it from Bulgaria. Maybe he's at a conference here. So he gets information about the shipping from abroad. Another example by Amazon, and I might mention them a few more times today. What they are very good is localization and geolocation. So every time I come to the main Amazon.com site, I usually get redirected to the Spanish one. Because I live in Spain, I live in Barcelona. So the offers in the Spanish Amazon site are more relevant for me. The prices are usually better, 
and the shipping is faster. So it's more convenient for me as a user. Uh, in addition to that, what Amazon is very good at is predicting what I want to buy and what I might intend to buy in the future. So recently, I've been viewing some books about growth hacking, about marketing. I'm really interested in that. And what Amazon does is they always analyze what other users are buying and suggesting me relevant things like John mentioned before as well. And they not only consider what I bought, but they also consider my online search practice. So for example, my boss came back from Singapore last week and she was constantly talking about this Lee Kuan Yew guy and his political ideas. And I'm very interested in politics, so I search books, search relevant uh, movies about him, and I constantly get information from Amazon about him. So maybe in a week, I'll consider that I want to buy a book about him. This is another example by Sephora. Um, I don't know if you can spot the difference, but uh, these are the two websites. One is from USA and one is from Canada. And what Sephora is very good at is localizing and offers of sales. So for example, if I'm buying from USA, they'll show me the products that are on sale in USA. If I'm buying from Canada, they'll show me the offers that are specifically targeted in Canada. It's very convenient for me because I'm in this country, I want to buy it fast, and cosmetics especially is something that you don't want to wait for a week or two weeks. Another uh, example is how can retailers use profile data and preferences by the user. And what jQuery is very good at is creating segments of the users. Uh, segments based on their search and segments based on their activities on the site. So what they do, they create groups like men, women, or people who search for kids' clothes, and they always target us with information related to promotion, sales, related to the specific segment. So let's get to the juicy stuff and talk about how can you implement personalization, or at least how you should start thinking about it, what should be the roadmap for you to personalize your site. And I created this five-step roadmap. I wanted to keep it simple and easy for you to follow. So the first step is to start on the basics. Gather your data. The second step is to define your goals. It differs from one retailer to another retailer, so you have to specify what you want precisely. Uh, the third step is start segmenting your audience. So start analyzing and comparing different groups that come to your website and create related segments. Fourth step is defining channel-specific strategies. And by channel-specific strategies, I mean it could be website, it could be mobile, it could be cross-channel experiences. But I will talk about the website today, and this is what I'll focus on, unless you want to spend eight hours with me. I don't think you do, so <laughs> let's stick to the website. And last but not least is test and repeat. It's constantly changing. Personalization is something that is ongoing uh, project and you have to constantly update it. So firstly, the first step is to gather the data. And by gathering the data, I mean understand where you stand now. I usually like to divide data in two different types of data, implicit and explicit data. Explicit data is something very, very specific. So something like your buyer completing an action, like favoriting an item, adding it to the shopping cart, favoriting it. This kind of specific actions that you can track with Google Analytics, cookies, Boolean, etc. And implicit data is something more general, but it gives you very good information about the user behavior. It's what they search, what they browse, where are they coming from. It helps you a lot as well. You should also start asking yourself questions about your website. Who is coming to my site? Are they finding the information they want? Are they leaving the website very fast? Start looking for problematic areas on your site. And by finding problematic areas, you will give yourself answers of what you want to do about the personalization. And a very important thing to remember with data is don't get creepy with data. It's very easy to get stuck into KPIs, metrics, and be all like, oh, I'm tracking this and this. But it's very important to also stay strategic and know what you want to track. 
So I want to show you one example, one video of how one company sees personalization in the future. So have a look. To be flawless People tell me not to let myself evolve startup in Barcelona and building this kind of personalization software. So this is the future and it's a bit scary. <laughs> um, the next step, uh, getting back to our personalization strategies to define your goals, as I said, and it differs from retailer to reta retailer. So for example, fashion days retailer in Bulgaria <coughs> might focus on the engagement of their users. Um, EMAC, for example, might want to increase the shopping cart. So as I said, define your goals and move on from there. The third step is starting to segment your audience. And when I usually start creating segmentation strategies for retailers, I tell them, think about the user groups that are most likely to convert. And I usually create these four groups at the beginning, uh, the basket size, lost souls, first timers, and careful spenders. And uh, basket size are the people who put something in their shopping cart, but they usually forget about it or they don't convert. It just stays there, so you have to do something to win them back. The lost souls are the people who look around your website, check some pages, maybe they browse through other products, but they also, they're a little bit lost. First timers are the people who come to your site for the first time and they need some kind of signals, trust signals, in order to engage with you. And careful spenders are people who need uh, long gaps of time before they purchase. So you also have to engage with them. And you can get much more deep of segmentation. You can segment them according to the demographical data, according to the life cycle stage, according to the different channels where they come from. It all depends on how much in depth you want to go and there are different ways to actually strategize. Um, the final step when you define the parameters, when you define the goals, when you define the segments, is to actually create channel-specific strategies. And as I said, I want to focus on the website, so I'll keep it on the website. Uh, but I don't want you to feel that this is how your website should look like. This might look like, oh, there are so many elements. but be data-driven and be very selective on what you choose uh, when you want to personalize your site. So let's get started with the essential parts of your e-commerce website. First, first impression is the home page. This is where the users come first and it's very important to get it right from the first moment. The main personalization tip is basically to show them what you got and make it different from user to user. Uh, so for example, I'm very into running, spinning, this kind of active sports, and I shop at Decathlon. So every time I go to their site, I usually get uh, promotions of running shoes, running clothes, and this is relevant for me. But for example, my grandma, maybe he likes golf, and this stuff will not be relevant for him. So make homepage different for different users, and attract them from the first moment when they enter. Another important thing is relevant recommendations. Show users what, they, what you got, basically. This is an example of uh, Ozone. And even though I don't understand Bulgarian, you saw it from the beginning, uh, I cannot see that they are promoting the new books, the new movies, 
the new games. And it's obvious for me, okay, this is what they're selling. And the types of recommendations that are most popular on the homepage are usually the most popular products, the most sold products, and products that have been viewed before by the user. Category page is the second part of your website that is also very important. And the common problem with retailers is that they leave it behind. It's like, oh, it's not important. I'll optimize my homepage and my product page. And category page, I leave it. But to be honest, there are only two ways that users can find your products. One is by internal search, and another one is by category page. So it's essential to optimize it as well. And the main personalization tip that I want to give you is personalize it based on specific brands that customers um, express the interest. So for example, ASOS, what they do, usually when you enter, there are two categories that they focus on, the women and men. And then once you enter the, the specific, like you're interested in women shopping and women clothes, then they give four or five most popular, most trending products in specific categories. And if you reviewed it before, they also give products and show products that you've been reviewing. Product page. Product page is also very, very important. And basically, the goal of every product page is to lead to this checkout process uh, for the customer to click, I want to buy it. Um, so you have to appeal to the various buying stages. And a good way to sell more or to personalize it is to apply various merchandising rules. By merchandising rules, I mean upselling, cross-selling, downselling. Uh, use this in your favor to sell more. For example, if there's a printing number, they sell printers. And usually, when you buy a printer, you need an ink as well, right? It's very obvious. But many retailers, they don't, op they don't maximize it and they don't use it. So think about the ways to con connect complementary products. Another example of our client, which is uh, selling cameras, and what they offer is relevant complementary products to, to cameras, like filters, tripods, etc. cetera. Uh, third part of your web page, search results. And I compare it to the um, uh, category page as well, because people usually think uh, people just search a little bit, but they don't really care about search results. It's very important. I think more than 35% of shoppers always search New York internal site. So it's very important to optimize it based on user preferences as well. Uh, for example, if I go to the retailer that's selling shoes and I look for the specific brand of Air shoes, they usually give me the top purchase products, which are sorted according to the popularity. And again, if I search for it before, if I'm interested, they provide these results as well. So optimize your search results and really focus on creating experience based on the preference of the user. Last but not least, part of your checkout of your website is the checkout page. And the goal here is, of course, to complete the purchase. So my main tip is to make it as painless as possible. Many times when I go shopping, people ask me extra information. People ask me to sign up. A lot of things and a lot of steps that I don't want to do as a user. Make it easy and make it like almost two click process for me. So I would like to get back again to the Amazon and their way of personalizing checkout process. And the main way, the main personalization thing that they do, they store all my information about the credit card details, about the shipping preferences, about my address, and it makes it so easy for me. It's, it's not intrusive, it's not annoying. For me, as a user, it's very, very convenient. And since John mentioned that almost 67% of people don't complete the, the checkout process, um, it's very important to mention here that don't just leave them there hanging. Uh, create campaigns that can win back the users, like shopping cart abandonments. Well, John explained it all, but I just want to focus that in this specific part of your e-commerce web page, it's very important to incorporate the emails. And last but not least, the last step is to constantly optimize and then test it. What worked yesterday might not work today. What works today might not work tomorrow. So you constantly have to test it. Use A-B testing. For example, if you have a checkout process and um, 
you want to A-B test different elements, focus on even like the color of a button can have a huge impact. So try different things, and during the time you will see what works best, and then you find other areas to optimize. Uh, so at the beginning, I mentioned the main reasons why you should personalize, and I said that it helps you through all the purchase fun. But if you looked and listened to me carefully, you might have understood that it's not only about that. It's about branding to start with. You brand your e-commerce store as a relevant place, as a personalized place to go and shop. It's also about engagement with the visitors. And it's also about a reduced churn rate and many other reasons that I mentioned here. So I really hope that you understand how important it is to create this one-to-one -one relationship with your users. And just to check if you listen to me carefully enough, do you remember since when Amazon started personalizing? Very good, you're not sleeping, okay. <laughs> Extra question. Do you know what percentage of Amazon sales actually come from personalization? Or can you guess? 75. That's a good optimistic guess, but uh, it's actually officially 35%. But just to show you that the small things, it might seem small for you, the, the tips that I gave, uh, but it actually has a huge impact. Usually personalization impact is from 20, 30% on sales. Amazon, of course, is an extreme example, but it really, really works. And my dear friends, I think it's very nice to finish this presentation and in general, the keynote speech by saying that I think now is the Bulgarian time to catch up, to become the next Amazon of Bulgaria. And I really hope that this is going to happen. And I just wanted to wish you luck. If you want to get in touch, I usually get a lot of <laughs> contacts and a lot of emails. So don't hesitate to write to me as well. And I'll be very happy to answer any of your questions about personal. <laughs> All right. Now let's get some of these final questions for the day. Uh, do I see a hand or a, a, a good? I thought somebody was scratching his head, but... <laughs> All right, I am very close to you right now. And the microphone in. Uh, yeah, can we hear each other? Okay. I can hear you. All right. Um, <clears throat> uh, most, uh, whatever you said on the presentation was uh, a little bit Western. And I'll hit you with an Eastern European question. Uh, it's um, about the um, differences that you show from the US to the Canadian side. And the one comment that you said, um, <clears throat> the, pro uh, the products are near because the customers want them faster, mm -hmm. as fast as they can. What if uh, here in Eastern Europe we have this possibility? Let's say we have a customer, he wants to buy something for 100 euro. Mm -hmm. And he has three possibilities. Deliver next day for 50 euro, deliver in one week for 25 euro, or deliver in three weeks for five euro. Based on your experience, uh, which shipping option would uh, the customer suggest? Would it be, would he be fine uh, in waiting for three weeks for very, very, very cheap? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, I would say it really depends on the product that you're buying. If that's something that is not urgent, of course, people like to wait if they can get a discount. But usually, many purchases are based on also emotions. And for example, clothes, if you buy, you just want to try it today, tomorrow. So I think you'll pay a little bit more to get it today. And it's also like the Amazon example of delivering two hours. This is what they're working on. This is their big focus, two hours delivery. This sounds crazy, but it just proves that the users want it faster. I think that's the answer. Yeah. Even 10 times more you can pay for delivery and you will be willing to. 10 times? I don't know if that happens many times that you pay 10 times, but... Yeah, it's three weeks for five euro and one day for 50 euro. It's real, I'm real numbers are these. I would stick to my answer that they want it faster in today, and this is how I would also purchase it, but of course, it depends. Maybe in this market, in Bulgaria, for example, it would be popular if they get a big discount, but this is what I believe. Thanks. You're welcome. All right, do we have another question? 
Wow. That's, uh... <laughs> All right. One of the most active uh, members from the public. Um, it, it's obvious that um, the world is going to personalization and one-to-one uh, -one experiences and everything. So can you tell us how exactly do you do that at uh, your company, Strands? Mm -hmm. What do you actually do? And say if I was a customer and I want you to optimize my online store, how, how would that process go? Mm -hmm. I will explain it, uh, I will try to explain it simple because it's a very technical aspect as well, but usually, well, firstly we meet and discuss what are your needs. Uh, then we discuss their, the current website, the conversions, we analyze their users their conversions, their product and catalogs, like for example, what are the most selling products, what are the least selling products, what would you like to change, then we think about the strategies to implement, and in terms of the technical aspect, it's, it's a line of code that you actually have to put on your website pages, and then we get the data about the user behavior, and based on that data, that there, there are algorithms that create uh, parts of your website that are personalized, basically. That's the idea, in simple. I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah, I still can't imagine how that whole thing works. Does it like, what, you, you can track the, the, what's happening to the users, this I understand and I think everybody can, but how does, how do you change my online store with just a line of code, I mean, how that, what can be changed, how can it be changed and so on. It's by tracking the patterns, the patterns of your users. So it differs from side to side, but for example, um, let's say we have a client of like gardener that sells garden stuff, like uh, things for gardening, I don't know specific terms, but you analyze, okay, let's say the category page. Uh, what tactics would convert in this specific category page or the shopping cart page? What do you recommend on the shopping cart page? Do users convert? Where's the conversion rate? And then you implement strategies. That's the idea. Thank you. And the last two questions here. Uh, okay, so Simona here. Um, you talked about stores that have a lot of products and a lot of categories, but what would you suggest? How would you personalize a website that has like five products, for, exa for example, or maybe only two categories? And um, people um, don't often go to categories, they go directly to the product pages, which are five, for example. Only five products? Yeah. I never worked with such a small uh, retailer, it's usually like at least 100,000 products, but in this way I would do it by myself, like I, I think it would be pretty easy to personalize your site on by yourself. I wouldn't use a software that, would, that is meant to be used for retailers that are selling more. I would, for example, focus, okay, what kind of email campaigns I can create, um, what kind of products are selling the most that I can maybe make special discounts for them on seasonal campaigns. I would personalize it by myself, I wouldn't use the software for a small, such a small retailer. Uh, I'm not talking about small retailer. For example, let's say um, Vitamix blenders, you've heard mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. What about, they, they sell only blenders, for example. Mm -hmm. And they like, have like five models. But they probably have a lot of features, like, uh, I don't know, actually, I never worked with retailer by products and I would create it on my own, the personalization strategies, I wouldn't use any, like upselling, downselling, if you have five products, you cannot do a lot. Okay, no. thank you. That's my two cents. Okay, hi. Uh, Hello, Simon. Yeah, uh, I have a quick question. Uh, we all know that personalization is great, it's good, it works. Uh, we've seen the data, we've seen the figures, uh, I have some, let's call it a silly question. Is there such a thing as too much personalization? Can this actually act as a, as a not as a trust builder, mm -hmm. but the opposite? So uh, have you had any cases where a customer uh, is, uh, is dissatisfied that, it, that it's too personal and mm -hmm. uh, worried that you know too much about him and so on and so on? Yeah, there's this topic of all the privacy and using the data and sometimes, of course, maybe some of the users feel that, oh, you're tracking what I'm doing on the site. 
um, and sometimes they they get a bit annoyed by the amount of emails that retailers want to send, but it's simply because they don't know how many to send. And as John said, you should think about it in a strategic way. Like, and I think that's the main way of when it gets annoying. But on the website, you have to make it so intuitive for the user that he doesn't feel that it's, uh, it's based on specific behavior that he was doing. So we had some cases, but we tried to do it like pretty like decent so that they don't feel it that we are tracking their data. OK, thanks. All right, give another round of applause.